hello everyone. Uh, my name is Wen Hu. I'm a professor uh, in University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. I will be the session chair for this session uh, on machine learning in an infants. And we have four papers, very excited paper in this session. And our first speaker is uh, Zhi, Zhi Shen. Uh, he is a postdoc at MIT, and he was in the intersection of applied photos and networks instance to build with configurable networks and photonic computers. He will be on the job market in the upcoming year. Zhi Shen is, can we come here? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zhi Zhenzhong from MIT. So today I'm going to talk about our work, Lightning, a reconfigurable photonic electronic smart link for fast and energy efficient inference. Machine learning is taking the world by storm. As a prime example, ChatGPT is the fastest growing online application ever. In just one month in January 2023, ChatGPT served 100 million unique visitors worldwide. And do you know how long does it take for Instagram to hit 100 million users? Two years. So ChatGPT is just one example of the machine learning renaissance. And there are so many applications like Google Bard, Midjourney, and GitHub Copilot. They are changing our daily life. And they are empowered by a type of computation called machine learning inference. As a result, there are billions of machine learning inference packages flooding global data centers. And this has massive implications for rethinking our systems and networks. So to build an efficient machine learning serving system, there are basically two requirements. Number one is latency, and number two is energy consumption. So for latency, live inference query response time should be less than 100 milliseconds. And for energy consumption, we should make applications like ChatGPT more energy efficient because its monthly electricity consumption is more than 175,000 people. There are huge incentives to build systems to optimize these two metrics. So in this talk, I will present Lightning, the first smart link system to serve real-time inference packets using photonic computing. And we're gonna achieve both low latency and energy efficiency. But what is photonic computing? Different from the prevalent electronic computing, Photonic computing uses light waves to perform computation in the analog domain. And actually, computers were born analog. In 1840, computer pioneer Charles Barbies conceptualized computers as analog devices. And in 1985, there were early demonstrations of optical neural networks. For decades, people have been, have been pursuing photonics for computing. This is because this technology can revolutionize the computing world. Photonics has two merits. Number one, it can compute at about 100 gigahertz, which is tens of times faster than electronics. And the second is, photonics consume as little as 40 attojoules per multiply accumulate operations, and this is hundreds of times more energy efficient than electronics. But if we look around, photonic computing has never gained practical traction. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna explain you the fundamental reasons of this problem and present our solution to make photonic computing practical and accessible in our modern data center infrastructures. So let's have a closer look at how does photonic computing work. So this is a transceiver, and it has been deployed worldwide for communication purposes, and you can buy it online easily for about 10 to 100 bucks. If you open up the transceiver, you're gonna see a very tiny laser source generating light, and there's another device called optical modulator that is modulating the light based on the input electrical data. And the output light intensity becomes proportional to the input uh, electrical voltage. This is a regular transceiver design worldwide in data centers. And the technique we're using here is to have a second modulator and run the modulation twice. So if we repeat the process, at the second modulator's output port, the double modulated light intensity becomes proportional to the element-wide product of the two input voltages. And if we use a photo detector to detect the signal and convert it back to electrical, we got the electrical result of a multiplication. We can further accumulate over time and get a vector multiply accumulate result. 
I want to note that this computing process is happening naturally, and the devices like moderator and photo detectors, they are passive device, and the computation is done as the light naturally propagates through the system. This is one of the reasons why photonic computing is energy efficient and fast, but it also gives us some challenges. So the challenge is that to serve a real world machine learning inference packet, photonic operations are mixed with electric operations. For example, in this machine learning example, when we receive a packet, we need to run packet processing in the digital domain, and then follows with flatten the vector and triggers the photonic multiply and accumulate. And then we need to go back to the electrical domain to run nonlinear, and for the following layers, we need to repeat this for several times until we reach the final result. Therefore, a control logic is needed to coordinate all the operations across photonics and electronics. And an even harder challenge is we have many different machine learning models, and so it requires the photonic electronic operations to be reconfigurable to accommodate to different models. For example, there may be one inference packet arriving in request model one, and we need to uh, prepare photonic, electronic, for photonic for the, for, for the packet. And there, at another moment, there's another packet may require completely different computing dependencies requiring different photonic and electronic computing sequence. So we, because we have so many different models, but the observation is that with all of the models, they actually uh, has a relatively smaller number of computing templates, like fully connected layers, convolutions, nonlinears. So all the diverse models, they are actually made of the combinations of all these uh, templates, that some of them may have 30 layers, some of them may have like 10 layers. So this made all the difference. So how do we achieve reconfigurable control all the way from packets to photonics? A strong approach is that we can involve a control plane and have a stop and go data movement, which is upon receiving a packet, let's ask control plane, what should we do? And control plane says, you should flatten it into a vector. And we ask again, control plane says, uh, you should use photonic for multiply accumulate, and so on and so forth. Every time we trigger a new uh, operation, we need to consult the control plane. And obviously, like we can find this way of achieving reconfigurability is, ha is enforcing us to have a deeply coupled control plane with the data plane. And as a result, it slows down the critical data path latency and increases the energy consumption. So is there a way to reach, achieve the reconfigurability at the runtime without compromising latency? The answer is yes. And we propose to co-design photonics and digital systems. And the key innovation is we develop a hardware programming abstraction to make control decisions right on the data plane. So by, con by inserting these abstractions onto the data pass, we can make control decisions as data moves across uh, the computing pipeline. And so in this way, we can eliminate the control plane entirely, and the data can get computed as it moves through and make control decisions. So these abstractions um, is the, the design goal of the abstractions, we should make it simple because we want to be low overhead, and we also want it to be effective and powerful because we need to support a wide range of deep neural networks. So this is our design. We propose a reconfigurable count action abstraction, and the high level idea is we trigger an action whenever the count result reaches the target. And this is very similar to uh, programmable switches, programmable match action table, RMT, but our count action gives more flexibility and allows runtime reconfiguration. The basic operation is we have a variable and we keep counting this variable until we reach the target. And if we reach the target, we trigger an action. And we can have a set of targets associated with a set of actions so that we can flexibly reconfigure the pipeline uh, at runtime. So we use this reconfigurable count action abstraction to connect all the essential components of a SmartNIC with photonic computing capabilities and this is our design. We spent about two years building the, the first fully functional Lightning Smartly hardware prototype in our optics lab at MIT. Our hardware prototype contains an 100G Ethernet interface, and our Lightning data bus logic is implemented on the FPGA with RF, DAC, and ADCs. In the photonic side, we have four modulators and one photo detector capable of running two multiply accumulating operations 
in parallel at 4 gigahertz. And I'm showing you a, a, video, a video of our demo. So I need to come on P, duplicate. Okay, here we go. So the lightning system is up. We open the Jupyter notebook to send some control signals. Before we run photonic computing, we need to calibrate the system. And now let's test if we can use the photonic computer to run a multiplication of 0 0.7 with 0 0.9. So as I mentioned, 0 0.7 is represented by the intensity, and so as 0 0.9. As you will see soon. And now let's run the compute. And you're going to see the intensity is going to be 0 0.63, which is exactly what we want. And now let's randomize get 256 randomized couples and see what's the computing result versus the ground truth, which is on the x axis, and the accuracy is 99%. I will go back to the presenter. So during the past two years, we realized building such an experimental setup presents a high bar for the entry uh, for the CCOM community. So we consolidate our setup and present an open source developer kit, which is uh, like this. I'm holding the one of the developer kit. This kit is fully made of commercial devices. You can buy it just online and assemble it. And it's super good for you to try out your crazy ideas about photonic computing. And if you are interested in this, you can sign up a sheet uh, a kit at lightning.mit.edu. We further perform large-scale simulations to evaluate seven different real-world machine learning models, including GPT-2. And our simulation results show that Lightning improves the average inference time by 40, by 42 to 337 x, while reducing the energy consumption by 52, uh, 54 to 419 times. In conclusion, Lightning is the first photonic electronic SmartNIC to serve real-time inference packets. Our count action abstraction enables runtime control and reconfiguration of photonic electronic computation tasks without interrupting the data flow. Our hardware and software are fully open source, and we look forward to working with members in the community to explore the exciting area of photonics. And finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Monia Gobadi for taking the risk with me to explore this idea and supporting me to build this unconventional system, as well as all the colleagues and co-authors in the past couple of years. And I think this is just the beginning, and I look forward to more exciting applications that we explore together uh, in photonic computing. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, very exciting talk. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Thank you for the exciting talk. Um, I'm Mahbub Hassan from University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, at the moment, when I use ChatGPT, um, I don't see latency is a problem. I get answers as soon as I finish typing. Um, are you um, implying that if photonic computing is used in the future, we can expect even better la latency? Um, thank you for the question. Yes, the answer is yes. Photonic computing can accelerate the inference serve time so that we can experience less latency. And there are more scenarios beyond ChatGPT. Like there are some scenarios that uh, require real time decision making. And those scenarios, latency is really uh, like number one uh, important factor. And number two reason is that photonic computing not only has the merits of uh, low latency, it can also reduce the carbon footprint of our data centers, which brings like great benefits to the global infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, hi there. I've got one more question. Uh, and, and great talk. Thank you so much. I'm Roman from Huawei Technologies. Um, since you are using uh, photonic computations, but you are using uh, electrical um, uh, packet switched network, do you have a plan or an idea or how to couple this photonic computations with photonic networks to uh, bypassing this conversion? Yeah, this is a great 
this is a great question. So we actually uh, thought about the convergence of photonic computing with our current fiber optics networks. And so we had a paper at Hotness uh, this year exploring this idea of distributing uh, photonic computing over a wide area of fiber networks. And I mean, like, this area is just very new, so there may be many new applications to come. So I'm happy to, like, discuss offline, and I'm sure there are many more exciting things to come up. Thank you. Let's spend the speaker you. again. Zishun, thank you. Uh, thank you. Our last speaker is Sudita. Uh, he's a PhD student at the University of Virginia. Uh, he's interested in research opportunity involving networks instance and machine learning. We, and his current focus being instance for deep learning influence serving. Uh, he will talk about Ada if. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am uh, Shudipto from the University of Virginia, and uh, today I'm going to present our paper, Ada Inf, uh, Data Drift Adaptive uh, Scheduling for Accurate and SLO Guaranteed Multiple Model Inference Serving at Edge Servers. So the deep learning applications are <coughs> so pervasive now. For example, the deep learning models are used to recognize the types of the vehicles and to recognize the human activities in a video surveillance application uh, for 360 degree understanding in self-driving cars and uh, in the generative AI applications that can generate image or text based on the user prompt. So one significant characteristic of these applications is that most of them are multimodal applications. That means that multiple deep learning models are included in one application. For example, in the video surveillance application, uh, given an input video frame, the object detection model first extracts the objects of interest, which are the vehicles and persons in this example. And then for each detected object, if it is a vehicle, it goes through the vehicle type recognition model to output cars and trucks. And if it is a person, it goes through the person activity recognition model to output walking in this example. So the overall workflow and the dependency between the models can be represented by a directed as like a graph or DAG. So after the deep learning models are trained, the deep learning applications are deployed at an edge server that serves the inference request generated in a specific locality. So there are various commercial options from Microsoft, Amazon, and Google for public edge servers now. So to illustrate this, after an application developer de develops some application, the application is deployed at an edge server. Then during inference, the client sends the inference requests to the edge server via 5G cellular network and the edge server responds to the clients with the inference result. Now with each inference request, there is a constant on the inference latency, for example, 100 millisecond, which is called the latency service level objective or latency SLO. Now unlike the distant cloud, the edge servers can provide ultra low millisecond level latency services as they are closer to where the user data is generated. However, an edge server has limited number of GPUs or low capacity GPUs. For this, the models deployed there are usually the compressed models. And these models suffer from decreasing accuracy due to data drift. For example, in the video surveillance application, at a certain timestamp, most of the cars are personal cars in a video frame. But after a short interval, most of the cars are police cars or ambulances due to the data drift. Due to an accident, this might, this might happen. And this uh, data drift negatively impacts the inference accuracy. So to address this, the system called Akia from Microsoft proposes performing continual learning or retraining at the same edge server where the inference is being executed because performing the retraining on the distant cloud delays the deployment of the updated model back to the edge server which, uh, due to the edge server to cloud communication time. However, we have found that when we do both retraining and inference at the same edge server, there is resource competition between these uh, different tasks, which results in uh, lower inference uh, accuracy and higher inference latency. So let's now look at why this occurs. So in this figure, the blue bar represents retraining and the yellow bars represent inference executions. 
So when we do retraining and inference both at the same edge server, the inference requests that are initiated before the completion of the whole retraining, which takes 40 seconds in this figure, cannot use the updated retrained model. So the inference requests suffer from low accuracy. So to address this, we can give more resource to the retraining so that the retraining is faster, but this takes away resource from inference, which results in higher inference latency SLO violation. Also, the existing method traverses possible resource allocation solutions for retraining and inference tasks of multiple models in a DAG, which results in long inference latency. So to address these problems, we propose ADA INF. Here our goal is to maximize the average latency SLO fulfillment and average accuracy of all the applications deployed at an edge server with short scheduling time. And also we want our system to be cost or resource efficient because GPO execution is expensive. Overall, our system has three major components. The first one is the data drift error retraining inference DAG generation. The second one is the data drift error GPU space and time allocation. And the third one is the host memory to GPU memory communication minimization. So in our first component, we observe that not all models of an application are impacted by data drift, and different models of an application are impacted differently by the data drift. Based on this, ADA INF periodically identifies which models of an application are impacted by data drift, and then it generates a retraining inference DAC of the application from the default DAC of the application. In this DAC, for each model that is impacted by data drift, ADA INF creates a node that represents the retraining task of that model, which needs to be executed first before the inference task of that model. Also, the node has an attribute called impact degree, and the models with higher impact degree requires more retraining time to be retrained with more retraining samples. So these retraining inference decks of the models are used in the second component in scheduling for GPU space and time allocation. So in this second component, we propose a method called incremental retraining that retrains a model as much as possible before every time it is used by an inference task. For example, if the application SLO is 400 millisecond and the inference requires 200 millisecond, we can do the retraining for the first 200 millisecond and still satisfy the latency SLO. So in this way, the inference requests that are initiated before the completion of the whole retraining can be executed on a version of the model that has been retrained on certain samples. And we observe that such incremental retraining can improve accuracy. And we also observe that using early exist structures with incremental retraining can significantly improve accuracy. Because when we use early exist structure of a model, we leave more time within the latency as well for the incremental retraining of the models. So overall, in our allocation method, we first optimally split the total GPU space among the applications to maximize the latency SLO fulfillment. Then for each application, we optimally split its GPU time to retraining and inference following incremental retraining to maximize accuracy. And then we further split the GPU time allocated for the application's retraining among the multiple retraining tasks of the applications based on that impact degrees. And finally, for each retraining task, we find the optimal number of retraining samples. And for each inference task, we find the optimal early exit structure. Further details of the scheduling can be found in the paper. So after the scheduling is completed, during model execution, our third component works, which minimizes the CPU me host memory to GPU memory communication, which takes up a significant portion of the overall inference latency. And to minimize this communication, we propose several strategies that exploits the dependencies between multiple retraining and inference tasks for a multimodal application. Further details can be found in the paper. So we have uh, performed large-scale experiments using real-world application on real-world trace data, and we compare with two uh, systems, Akia and uh, two variants of Scrooge, so which is a cost and latency SLO efficient inference serving system which assumes the retraining is performed on the cloud. So we observe that our ADA INF system can provide up to 21% higher accuracy. Uh, it achieves up to 54% lower latency SLO violation and achieving the similar level of accuracy as ADA INF requires four times higher number of GPUs for AKIA, which means ADA INF is four times higher cost or resource efficient which translates to thousands of dollars in cost saving. So in conclusion, the deep learning models deployed at an S server suffer from data drift. And to address this, when we want to do both retraining and inference at the same S server, 
there is resource contention between the different tasks which negatively affects the accuracy and latency as well as fulfillment. And to address this, we propose at inf that leverages incremental uh, retraining novelly along with other methods and outperforms the existing systems by a significant margin. So thank you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me for questions or collaboration opportunities. Thank you for the wonderful speaking. And my question is that uh, from your presentation, it seems that it improves latency and uh, accuracy for the inferencing stage. So my question is that can this be used for just improve the training speed for like federal learning? Uh, so, so our system has some assumption that is specific to inference, for example, the uh, very ultra low millisecond level latency requirement uh, that is like that applies for the inference scenario. And within this latency SLO, we try to interleave the retraining and inference operations. So the, uh, so the basic method for incremental retraining, uh, I'm not sure whether that will be applicable only for the training scenario because uh, some assumptions of the system is like dependent on the necessity of inference actually. Okay. So, I see the point that you improve your latency by uh, incrementally retrain your data, but uh, does it guarantee that during this incremental process, the system is always like uh, close to a, a local minimum that if you drift this too much, it could uh, first increase the loss by a lot of, uh, by, by, by a big amount, and then this, the, the neural network becomes an unstable state which like outputs potentially very low quality and then you add more training data, it, the loss function decreases again. So uh, how, how can you guarantee the like, continuous uh, property that you, when you incrementally add data, it, will, it, it continually guarantees the quality of uh, your inference uh, 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 in addition to your guarantee of latency? Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, we, we have we have seen that uh, sometimes when you use incremental retraining, theoretically it is possible that the instantaneous accuracy can be low, but uh, overall for the as like in this uh, paper and in the like related existing systems, we are mainly concerned about the average accuracy over a period. So we have seen that when you use the incremental retraining, uh, the average accuracy over say 50 second or 100 second is like better, like significantly better than like not doing the incremental retraining, but the instantaneous accuracy is, uh, can be a factor. Yeah, and uh, we are looking into that as one of our future works actually. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's find the speaker again. Our last speaker is Jun Chai Liu. Uh, he is a fifth year PhD student from Tsinghua University. His research interest is machine learning system, and he is currently on the job market. And his talk is about Yanus. Jun Chai. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jun Chai Liu from Tsinghua University. Today, I'm very glad to share our work, Janus, a unified distributed training framework for sparse mixture of expert models. In recent years, ChatGPT has led a new trend, and it has been applied in many applications, such as education, search engine, and personal assistance. 
It's also said that the powerful GPT-4 adopts a mixture of XBOM structure. Besides, we can also see that the size of models are increasing rapidly, and many of recent huge models are MOE. So what is MOE model? A MOE model includes many experts. The model takes sequence of tokens as input, such as a sentence. The model will select the specialized experts to handle each token and generate the output. As we can see, with a large amount of experts, MOE model can have strong capability. MOE is usually combined with transformer. A transformer model consists of many transformer layers. Each layer mainly includes a tension layer and a feedforward network. As for MOE models, each layer mainly includes a tension layer, a gate, and many experts, which are feedforward networks. After the token go past the tension layer, the gate will select the best feedforward network for each token. Thus, each token only activates parts of experts. With sparsely activation, MOE is very computation friendly. For example, a GPT-3 model has 175 billion parameters, and each sample will require 732 trillion flops. While MOE model can have similar parameters to dense model, but only require 7.3% flops. Besides, high performance GPU resources are scarce. It's reported that the NVIDIA's best AI chips show out until 2024. So sparse MOE is a promising and necessary way to explore. Unfortunately, training an MOE model is non-trivial, since the expert layer includes a huge number of parameters. Expert parism is required in distributed training. Specifically, the expert layer is split by workers. Existing solution to train MOE model is inefficient because it requires close worker communication. There are two stages in each iteration, forward propagation and backward propagation. In the, backward, in the forward propagation, the tokens are sent to the target experts by auto-communication. After the expert computation, the result will be fetched by another auto-communication. So there are two auto-communication in each MOE layer in each iteration in the forward propagation. Similarly, in the backward propagation, there are still two auto or communication. Auto or communication is very time consuming and slows down the training. We profile three kinds of MOE models and find that the auto or communication can account for a significant proportion in iteration, which makes the training inefficient. In case of GPT-3 with MOE model, there are even 384 times of auto or communication required in each iteration. So to train MOE model in an efficient way, we rethink the essence of auto or communication. The goal of the auto-communication is to put token and expert together and then execute computation. Existing solution keep experts in place and exchange tokens by auto-communication. So any other solutions? We propose that we can also keep token in place and fetch experts from remote. In our solution, the fig forward networks are exchanged between workers. After the required experts are fetched in the local GPU, the token can be directly executed in the local GPU and get the results. We name the existing solution as epicentric since the experts are in place, and we name our solution as data-centric since tokens are in place. If the size of experts is much smaller than the size of tokens, data-centric is more efficient. Let's take an example to compare. When training MOE models in a 32 GPU clusters in this setting, Expert-centric will generate 0.75 GB traffic across a machine, while data-centric has a lower traffic workload and can be more efficient. We also analyze this, the optimality of data-centric. We can update the gain of data-centric as follows. Genus is a unified framework. If the gain is greater than one, it will adopt data-centric, and otherwise, it will fall back to expert-centric. As for the design and implementation, the first challenge is redundancy traffic and limit GPU memory. For example, in this four GPU cluster, each, cl each worker should fetch three experts from other workers. However, without careful design, traffic is redundancy from the view of the whole machines. Besides, since the GPU memory is limited, it cannot hold all experts at the same time. The second challenge is heterogeneous links. When we use host memory as cache to solve the problem of limit GPU memory, the experts have to be broadcast from host memory to each GPU. In a typical GPU machine, GPU and CPU is connected by a PCIe switch. 
and two GPUs share the same PCIe switch. Thus, each expert will pass the PCIe switch twice. And there is a redundancy traffic in the switch. The third challenge is busy traffic. In the MOE layer, the traditional way is to fetch experts after the data flow reached the gate. When the data flow reached the gate, the system went for fetching experts, which is inefficient since the traffic is bursting. The overview of Janus is as follows. There are many GPU machines in the cluster. Firstly, each GPU machine has a host expert manager, which is responsible to fetch experts from other machines. With the help of host expert manager, Janus design hierarchical communication for the inter-machine optimization. Secondly, each GPU machine has many GPUs, and the host expert manager should send experts to the GPUs frankly. There are many heterogeneous links in a machine, such as PCIe links and VLinks. Janus designed a project aware communication for the inter-machine optimization. Thirdly, each GPU machine also has a scheduler for fetching. As for busty traffic problem, Janus designed prefetch strategy for traffic scheduling. Let's move on for each design. The first one is hierarchical communication. Janus designed an expert manager wireless in host memory. Each machine only fetch a copy of other experts in iteration and catch them in the CPU host memory. Then the manager broadcasts the expert to each GPU. In the backward phase, each worker should send back gradient to original worker of each expert. The expert manager will then catch these gradients and reduce gradients of the same experts. Then only the summation results of gradients are sent back. In this way, the cost machine traffic is greatly reduced. The second one is topology aware communication. We want to make the best use of MV links to release PCIe pressure. We separate expert in host memory into two groups. Each GPU is responsible for fetching one group through PCIe switch, and then fetch another group through MV link from its peer. The third one is prefetch strategy. It fetch experts once the model begins full computation. Supports a model includes Valina transformer layer and MOE layer. When token goes through Valina transformer layer, all the attention and gate in the MOE layer, the experts are fetched at the same time. When the tokens reach the gate, some of experts has been fetched, and the system does not need to wait a long time for fetching experts. Our evaluation is performed on 32 GPU cluster. We evaluate end-to-end -end performance on the three models, BERT, GPT, and Transformer with MOE. Genus requires less iteration time than the tutor baseline. We also take a recent study of these optimizations. Compared with the expert-centric baseline, data-centric paradigm provides the main contribution, and the topology of communication and prefetch strategy makes an incremental and effective contribution. To conclude, Genus is a unified distributed training framework for accelerating distributed MOE training. We propose a new training paradigm, data-centric. In data-centric, Genus reduces cross-machine traffic with hierarchical communication. It accelerates inter-machine communication with topology over communication. It also makes best use of spare network resources with pre-fetch strategy. This is the end. I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for your talk, Roman from Huawei Technologies. Um, the, my question is regarding how do you um, spin out um, GPU kernels? In order to redistribute experts, you need to run them on GPU, correct? And that requires to spin out a kernel, a computing kernel, and that is a latency involved. Have you an idea, do you have an idea is that latency, or have you measured that, or it's not a problem for you? Well, actually, I don't, uh, I don't separate the GPU kernel. Uh, in our implementation, we set a, buff, uh, a buffer. So uh, the a worker will, pr will fetch all experts of outside machine into the uh, host memory, and in the, 
computation, the worker will fetch one expert from host memory, and then they will uh, execute the expert computation. At the same time, it will fetch another expert from host, uh, host memory. Yes, and that computation on GPU is done by CUDA kernel or not? Uh, we don't fix any CUDA, anything about CUDA kernels. We, we do this in the application layer. Got it, thank okay. you. Any other questions? Uh, otherwise, we turn the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker of this session is Roy Hay. Uh, he's a director in Google, and he has more than 150 patents, publications in the area of optical internet, switching, and networking. And he received his bachelor degree from UC Berkeley and master and PhD from Stanford. He's also an Otica OSA fellow. Thank you. And he's going to talk about uh, library. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you for the nice introduction, Professor Hu. Uh, let me get my presentation. Okay. Not yet. Oh, all right. Oh. So you, you need to do the. All right, thank you. That means I get an extra 30 seconds, no. Um, so the title of my talk is Lightwave Fabrics at Scale Optical Circuit Switching for Data Center and ML Systems. So as you can tell, uh, the key word or the key theme is Lightwave Fabrics. So let me start with a quick overview. So what is a Lightwave Fabric? It is a fabric that provides direct optical connections between network endpoints. And the key components are an optical circuit switch or an OCS, WDM optical transceivers that are co-designed with the OCS, circulators, and the corresponding control plane. Now, why should you care about lightweight fabrics? Well, they're reconfigurable, and they can be used both for the data center network, DCN, and ML use cases. And they give you superior performance while maintaining cost and energy efficiency, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. I'll also talk about our decade-long experience with these fabrics and specific system-level benefits for the ML use case. Okay, so first going over the lightweight fabric for the DCN. So on the left, you have your traditional closed-style DCN, uh, which we presented back in 2015. And on the right, you have the lightweight fabric-enabled DCN, which replaces these spine switches with the OCA-spaced lightweight fabric for a direct connect style topology. And by removing the spine switches and the corresponding EPSs and the optics, you can have these significant reductions in the cost as well as the power. Now in addition to that, uh, additional benefits are you can do incremental expansion of the network, topology engineering, and you can also do heterogeneous networking. And more details can be found uh, in the paper that was presented last year. Okay, next, so lightweight fabrics now for machine learning systems. So in our machine learning systems, the fundamental building block is this four by four by four 3D torus style cube. So there's 64 nodes or TPUs per block. And then there's 64 of these blocks. Now the 64 blocks are attached to this lightweight fabric and the OCS is such that any face of the cube can be connected to the opposite face of any of the other 63 cubes. So what that means is you have a large degree of flexibility, so you can create with the OCS these different configurations or what we call slice shapes from the 64 blocks. So as an example, what's shown here is you can take, you know, you can stack your cubes and adopt the Rubik's Cube style, or you can adopt a different shape like a cigar. So, in addition, uh, this flexibility gives you improvements in terms of 
a large number of par parameters, uh, scale, availability, power, and performance. I'll talk about uh, later in the presentation. Okay, uh, next is an introduction of the key components. So first is the OCS, uh, the optical circuit switch. So for our OCS, we adopt a MEMS mirror-based switching approach. Uh, so it's got the N inputs and N outputs. And by turning these micro mirrors here, you can go from any input to any output. Uh, it's a non-blocking switch. And you can also have near-perfect isolation, which means you can uh, set the connections and they can be fixed and isolated while basically you're moving the other connections. So that allows you to partition. Okay, next key com components of the WDM transceiver and the circulators. So this is actually showing the end-to-end -end link for our machine learning system. Uh, so start over at the right, you have your, whoops, sorry, TPU motherboard. You have the TPU ASIC, which connects to the OCFB optical transceiver. Uh, these optical transceivers uh, have a high degree of multiplexing so that we can efficiently use the OCS. Uh, the first multiplexing is WDM, or wavelength division multiplexing, so you have multiple wavelength channels per fiber. Uh, the second multiplexing we do is with these circulators over here. Uh, so the circulator is a non-reciprocal optical device that allows you to do bi-directional communication on a single fiber. Uh, additional benefits of this approach are that this OCS and the fiber plan itself is all data agnostic. So that means we can just keep reusing uh, the same OCS, the same hardware for different generations of the platforms as well as the interconnect. Uh, now the challenges are that you have more components through the link, right? So you have more stuff. So there's the OCS, there's the circulator, so that means higher losses. Uh, you also have what we call multi-path interference effects in, in bi communications, which, which we have to deal with. Okay, so now next are the hardware quote-unquote results. So this is our Palomar optical switch. So on the left is the high-level design illustrated. On the right, you have a photo of the actual inside of the chassis. Um, it's 136 by 136 ports. Uh, one notable key point about the design is we're using this uh, camera-based mirror control scheme, which allows us to simplify uh, greatly the design and the manufacturing, and that allowed us to build a lot of these and still building a lot of these. So. And for more details, please, please refer to the paper. Okay, so in terms of the actual performance of the OCS, so I talked about loss being really important. So, uh, the insertion loss, which is the number of photons you're losing through the OCS. The results are shown here. So this is the histogram of the N by N connections. You can see the histogram is low and it's tightly distributed, which is exactly what you want. Now, just as important as the insertion loss is the return loss. So the return loss is basically the reflection from the OCS. And the reason is it's important. You can imagine with a bi die link, any kind of reflection on the link is going to basically superpose on signal going in the other direction as noise. So that's why you want low reflections. And you can see the team was able to achieve return losses of down to 46 dB, uh, typical. And actually, that's, that's pretty phenomenal uh, levels of return loss. So, so kudos to the team, especially at scale, I should imagine, because we make a lot of these. So. OK, next, the optical transceiver results. So this is showing five generations of transceiver interconnect that we've developed and deployed. Um, so millions and millions of transceivers that we delivered to production. Um, there's a few notable points. First is that uh, these transceivers are not standard, so we're actually optimizing them for the lightweight fabric use case. So that's number one. Number two, we were able to drive down the cost and the power per gigabit per second uh, by orders or orders of magnitude uh, as we progressed through this roadmap. And the last point, again, to emphasize is that we're using actually the same exact OCS hardware and the fiber plant throughout these five generations and, and even beyond. So that's, that's the beauty, again, of being data rate agnostic. Okay, in terms of the actual specific optimizations that we've done on the transceivers. 
Uh, first, again, the high limp budgets, the high losses. So we deal with that by having have higher speed and higher performing components, uh, so lasers. We also adopt more optical integration. So again, you have here the circulator, which is actually integrated inside the transceiver to reduce the losses. And we're also adopting unique forward error correction techniques, as well as other digital algorithms that we've developed and place them inside this DSP ASIC uh, in order to further increase the link budget and go beyond what the standards are doing. So lots of innovation on the transceiver. Okay, so those are the hardware results, the component results. This is CENTCOM, so you, you guys are probably waiting for the system results. So these are the system results. What this is showing is the ML system availability with versus without the lightweight fabric. So you've got our 4,000 plus TPU system, right? So what this plot is showing is if you want to maintain 97% availability of the slice sides that's shown on the x-axis, the y-axis is showing, is, is showing basically the percentage of TPUs that you could effectively use. So the gap, the rest of it to 100%, you have to have as spares in order to guarantee that availability, right? So, and you can see the dark lines are with the lightweight fabric. You can build these larger slice size systems with reasonable sparing, right? So it's, it's simple, you just take all the cubes, you pick out the ones that are actually working, and you form your slice, and you're done, right? Uh, versus, obviously, with a static system, and the dash line, obviously, you can't do that. So the, you, can't, you basically can't build these larger slices, right, with the availability that's required. So bottom line is, like I said, uh, to reliably build these larger systems, the lightweight fabric can do it versus, you know, the direct connect, the static topology really cannot. So. Okay, uh, cost and power comparison now. Uh, so again, the baseline is the static direct connect. You can see the lightweight fabric has small increases in cost and power, but you get all the availability and performance benefits. Uh, you can also do an EPS-based fabric, but you get the much larger increases in cost and power, and you don't get the additional benefits of greater scale, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, last, last slide. Um, so this is performance. So uh, this is actually showing the model training taking advantage of the lightweight fabric availability to shape the slice or the brain, so to speak, differently, right? So the benchmark is uh, this cube, the Rubik, Rubik's cube, as I refer to it, right? So, so you see these three language LLM models. So LLM2, actually, there's, there's no speed up because the cube is the best, so that's not very exciting. But you can see for LLM0 and 1, actually, there's a 1.5x and even up to a 3.3x speed up uh, by shaping the configuration accordingly. So that's... That's actually pretty astounding. We're, we're obviously quite excited. It's hard to get 3.3, uh, factors of 3.3 improvements in the real world these days. So, um, and I think my time is up. Uh, so Q&A, we can go through maybe future work or any other questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have time for numbers of questions. Go first. Mm -hmm. Ian from ByteDance Networking. Uh, very impressive work to see such uh, large scale deployment of the OCS in the Thank production you. system. I noticed Google has published another work last year uh, about deploying this OCS system for their fabric. Right. Uh, so, wonder if there are any uh, difference or it's, it, this, this new work is, is different in terms of the system design and control plan to the last year. And, and sec second question is kind of Simple. What's your vision about? I know Google has been the pioneer of uh, pushing this optical train to the data center for past decade, mm -hmm. but the, the entire rest of the industry seems a little bit re reluctant accepting this concept of deploying the OCS. What's your vision? What's your biggest obstacle in the past in, in your in your experience in the past decade driving this? inside Google's data center. Thank sure, you. yeah, I mean, that's, that's the lessons learned. Um, yeah, I mean, so we announced that we're building our own hardware, our own OCS. I mean, that wasn't a choice that we actually wanted. It was only 
because we couldn't find the vendor ecosystem to actually support and build and give us the hardware that we needed, right? So that's, um, that was a choice by sort of, you know, a forced choice, if you will. So um, I would say, yeah, I, I, <laughs> you, you pinpoint a good question, but um, I mean, there were definitely a lot of hard-won sort of lessons in terms of what works and what doesn't, including just being able to ramp and scale and build the hardware not just the OCS, but also the transceivers. The other thing I would say is that, you know, you have this sort of nice picture of, oh, the OCS lasts forever, but then, you know, the interconnect, interconnect roadmap, we didn't know what was gonna happen. You know, we, weren't, we didn't know that you're gonna use PAM4 signaling and these other things, and, you know, making sort of the interconnect work for 10 plus years, that was definitely very challenging, so. Um, it's hard to predict the future, I would say. So there's, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but there were, I could, I could go on and on, but there, there are definitely lots of struggles, but uh, we're at a point where obviously, you know, we're getting very uh, substantial benefits, so we're, we're quite pleased. Yeah, hi, Shushaban from RISE, so very nice talk. So one of the things that I would like to ask is that how do you find the like optimal structure of that cube for different kind of like applications, right? Something 16 cross 16 cross 16 or four mm -hmm. cross something. And second thing is that is the same structure you are going to use for the whole training or you need to change, like change the structure itself? Yeah, so the second question, let me just get, this. so the, the configuration is fixed during the training for now. I think you could explore, you know, in training shaping as well, although you obviously have to deal with the overhead of switching. Um, in terms of how do you know which one, um, I mean, there's, this is Google, so there's an algorithm. Um, I think the, the paper goes into details, but it's really about, um, you know, model sort of, you know, model parallelism heavy versus data parallelism heavy. So I think in the case of the cigar shape, it's very data parallelism heavy. Um, so again, depending on sort of, what the model emphasizes, the shape sort of trends towards certain directions. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm an optics person, so that's probably as deep as I can go. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, can the speakers come up? I think we have a short panel session. Do you guys, <laughs> okay, yeah, you start. Uh, can you, the speaker, do you have a microphone? Yes. Oh. yes. Hi, this is Mahmoud from Mali. Sorry, I take him by surprise. <laughs> so just uh, a lot of people are discussing the training so far, but one paper in particular about uh, the optical uh, filtration oh, discussed yeah. the inference. So one of the main issues is how, what is the bottleneck when it comes to inference? It's like the, the latency is not the main issue right now. It might be something else that we are not aware of, or maybe something that makes the inference really will become a bottleneck in the future, and we need to do something right now in order to address this in, in, in future work, something like this. So it's just an open question for giving it some insight. So, yeah, so I think like uh, inference is like significantly different in uh, training in the perspective like the uh, latency requirement uh, for the inference it like uh, really depends on the application requirements actually. So, so what types of applications are like actually uh, running for the inference. So for example, like uh, think about the virtual reality application, the latency requirement is like really low there. and. Uh, so, and also it depends like what types of models are running. And uh, so, uh, so when we go from the training to inference, so we have to rethink those things because uh, like training is kind of uh, most of the time, uh, maybe a one-time thing over the time you might want to fine tune the system, that's it. But uh, in the inference, so it's a kind of user facing system. So kind of like lots of users are using the system and at the same time they are sending the requests and uh, at the same, uh, so you, you need to have a scheduling and also some uh, like optimization at the serving engine side that can handle like uh, such scalability. 
And uh, yeah, mainly the uh, challenge here is uh, for such large uh, like scalability and how you can like uh, like handle the very low inference requirement for all the users. And uh, yeah, and it should depend on both the application and on the uh, and it should exploit the specific characteristic of the model. For example. Uh, the mixture of expert models uh, when you do the training of these models and uh, when you do the inference of these models, these two things are different actually. And you can obviously exploit different uh, characteristics of this model in this uh, different uh, training and inference setup. So, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> yeah I want to echo that latency is certainly uh, important in machine learning inference. Uh, like many applications, like when users send packets uh, to the cloud, cloud data center for inference, you want to serve the packets as soon as you can. So potentially, I think an interesting uh, topic to explore is how do we actually run the inference uh, in the network uh, on the data pass that will give to you the minimum latency. And this is also good fit for, for inference because inference, uh, you can have a pronged model or uh, reduced model so you don't need a huge um, large model to, to serve. And second thing I want to mention is energy. Like, you train model only once, but user may require this model for inference for millions of times. So energy is also another important metric that inference system should consider. Yeah, that's my take. So as for the inference latency, I think this question is about my topic. So, uh, so you know, uh, I focused on MOE, and the purpose of to propose MOE is, I think, is to solve the inference latency of the giant models. You know, for the dense models like GPT-3, the parameter has reached 175 billion, parameter, uh, billion parameter, parameters. So if we want to make the model bigger, but we don't want to uh, increase the latency when, put, um, when, inf um, when the model uh, is inferenced, so we we make the model uh, with in the MOE ways. So the latency will not increase as the model, per, uh, as the size of the model parameter increase. Uh, yeah. So going forward, I think the inference serving system, the future inference serving system mostly should focus on the cost and energy efficiency because like inference is like continuous things. So cost is a like huge issue, I think, for any big corporation when they are trying to make the inference system scalable for like uh, billions of users. Uh, I have a question uh, for for Wahe. So you have done Google has done excellent job uh, in terms of rolling this out. So my question really is like, can the research, how can the research community like Sitcom play a, play a role on, uh, on defining or you know, participate in the future work? So this is my first time at Sitcom, but I've been impressed with the papers and the creativity. I think um, you know, we're presenting this and we're talking about more of a work for reason to engage the community. So I think you know, we're just looking for good ideas. So. Just keep publishing. I think we have some job. We have a, <laughs> a desk for job openings, so uh, please apply. But um, yeah, we're always looking for creative engineers. So um, I think the other thing I would say is, me as an optics person, I'm obviously biased, but we feel that the switching is something that's that we have at scale that's enabled. There's lots of ideas before, but I don't think you could actually, you know, they were not adopted in production. So now that we have a proof of principle, like an existence proof, I think you can say, okay, now can I build on top of this? So I think there's plenty of room for, for additional work, so. Thank you. Uh, one last question. <laughs> May I ask a question on uh, optical circuit switches? Uh, why don't you uh, change topology and switch during the training job? Is the switching latency problem and um, what is the switching latency? Is it around 10 milliseconds? And uh, do you see that uh, we can go below 10 milliseconds switching latency? Yeah, so um, I think the paper mentioned it, but during training switching, I mean, that's something I think that's uh, future work, you know, give us, you know, we're taking step at a time. We have very large performing scans, even sort of initially you have a fixed configuration, but I, I certainly think that's, that's an area. At the same time, 
like I said, I think someone asked me, but um, there's obviously the switching overhead. It is tens of milliseconds, but that's just the physical switching. There's also the transceivers are not designed to do you know, fast locking, let's say. So in terms of link training, stuff like that, those are things that you'd have to look at. Obviously all the, you know, it, it also depends on how deterministic, obviously the traffic patterns are, et cetera. If you're kind of dog chasing its tail and you're never sort of, you know, the trade-offs are where, again, the overhead is too large, so you're never kind of taking advantage of it. So, um, yeah, there's definitely lots of work to do there, but I, I think it's, it's potentially interesting, so. Okay, that's great. Uh, we are five minutes over time. Uh, this concludes this session. Let's thank the speakers again. Uh, we're gonna take a <laughs> we're gonna take a break and come back in twenty five minutes. Sorry, uh, the speaker of next session, please come here to meet your session chair, Shuman. Yeah, my team is right. Optics for 